My name is Trip Gorman, and in this episode of SME VC, I sit down with Francisco Garcia Osuna. He's an associate at Melek and the founder and host of the Levantando podcast, where he interviews top VCs, but in Spanish. He's also the co-founder of Rising Latam VCs, where he's building community around professionals working in the expanding field that is Latin American venture capital. Fran was previously a senior investment analyst at Duke's Capital. In this episode, we discussed the differences in salary and benefits between Latin American-based VCs and US-based VCs, and how the work experience and compensation of Latin American VCs will improve in the next decade. We discussed why and how LATAM startup valuations have changed over the past year, why where you went to school matters in the Mexican venture capital ecosystem, how Mexico's technology and venture capital growth compares to Brazil three to five years ago, and thus what should we expect to see in Mexico in the coming three to five years. We discussed all this and more in this episode of Semilla VC. Okay, Fran, could you start by telling the audience a bit more about your work history up to and including your current role at Melee Capital? Yeah, uh, glad, glad to do that. And, and first of all, thank you so much for the invitation trip. Uh, really nice to be here. And yeah, I, I started uh, my career in, in, in venture capital. I think I was one of the really lucky persons that straight off, out of college got into venture capital. Uh, I started economics here in Mexico City. Uh, then I joined Duke's Capital. Duke's Capital is a venture capital fund investing in all the continents, investing in, in, in Latin Americans like Latinos in LATAM and Latinos in the US. So it's uh, quite a unique thesis. I was there a year and a half. Uh, it was a really great experience, like really growing, learning a lot, like getting to know what the venture capital industry was. And I I joined Duke's Capital in uh, November 2020, like right before all the fever we saw in 2021, all the excess capital, all the crazy valuations, all the things going on in the market. So I was before that, during that, and now I'm still in the industry after that. So it was really nice uh, for me to see all these faces in this uh, cycle that, that that we saw and, and all the things happening in the, in the macroeconomic and microeconomic. So really interesting. And well, after an amazing uh, year and a half uh, at, at Dux Capital, then I joined Melec Capital. Melec Capital, it's a, we are a new venture capital fund based in Mexico. We invest all over Latin America. We invest in three main verticals. Uh, it's fintech, prop tech, and consumer brands. And I joined five months ago. I'm leading the efforts of the fund here in, in Mexico City. The managing partners have a background in real estate and, and also founding a startups in, in the dark kitchen. So it's a like it's been a great ride. And aside from from my experience at Melec Capital and Dux Capital, I have a do some things on the side that like really really proactive i, I consider myself really, really proactive uh rising latin VCs. it's a, a community i co-created with some other two uh, friends from 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 the vc industry and like uh, i'm really involved into this content creation for venture capital in latin america and create i also uh, host a podcast so that's uh, basically me it's been a really great uh, experience of almost two years since I joined the venture capital industry. I want to touch on all parts of that. But first, you mentioned you made the jump straight to VC right after college. I'm in that same boat of wanting to do that, although I'm a couple of years before you. What's your response to people who say, you know what, you should probably work at a startup or maybe go into investment banking or work at a management consultant before going to VC? What's your rebuttal to that question? Whoa, it's a really interesting question because I've heard it many times from people who want to join uh, venture capital. And the thing is, it's when, when I joined, uh, like the industry and the ecosystem was really different from what it is today. And also in the US, uh, if you compare the US to Latin America, it's really different. Like in the US, like that kind of traditional, uh, many people say there are different paths. There is no only one path, but the most common path to join a venture capital fund in the US is like, okay, you have to go to this three years of investment banking or three years um, uh, at consulting, then you get your MBA and then you can get into venture capital. But in Latin America, that was different. Like uh, two years ago or one year and a half ago, it, it I, I think it's still, it, it still is today uh, different because uh, it's a growing industry. And 
for people that want to join a, a venture capital fund, it's like be, really being active, understand the um, understand what is happening in, in the venture capital industry in Latin America. There are many other ways like you, you can get into like, okay, uh, like what, what you're doing right now, like doing a podcast, interviewing founders and, and venture capitalists. So that's a really great way to stand out. So that's a great way to get into venture. And also what, what you mentioned earlier, like you can go and work in startup and have this operating experience that can be really valuable when you are on the other side like making the decisions of investments so you can have this empathy from the other side so there are many ways but uh, like re being really proactive i think that's the, the best way to to land a job into in, in the vc world speaking about being proactive you founded co-founded Rising Latam VCs. Could you discuss a little bit more about why you started that, what the goal there is and what you're doing there? Yeah, Rising Latam VCs, we are uh, an organization of analysts and associates, well, recently partners from other VCs joined, of venture capital uh, folks in, in Latam, well, Spanish-speaking Latam. Uh, we are really a proactive and engaged community in where we share deals. We have uh, networking calls. We have events. Actually, uh, three weeks ago, uh, it was our, our first uh, physical event here in Mexico City. And it, it was a, such a great success. It, it was a, a pitch day. Like, really, the idea behind uh, creating this community, it was an idea of me, uh, Fran Arocha from uh, he, he was uh, at Cloud Capital at the moment of of founding uh, Rising Latin VCs and Daniel Porras from from Dalus. Uh, we were like uh, going uh, like thinking about the idea and we created the group. We added other folks from other venture capital funds in Latam and the main idea was to false to to bolster the ecosystem in Latin America like connecting people, creating uh, these atomic networks all over Latin America. We have presence in Mexico City, in Bogota, in Buenos Aires, in Santiago, in Chile. Like, we really are involved in the venture capital ecosystem, and we really want to create something useful for everyone. Uh, and for example, we published the first Latin America compensation reports in 2021 we just published a 2022 report and this was just the first one and in the u.s you have this epca and other uh, other communities and associations creating this so that's kind of we want to emulate and we want to really uh, uh, foster the ecosystem around uh, latin america do you have any insights from that uh, compensation report, like high level bullet points that you want to share that are that, that are quite interesting? Because I, I love that you took the initiative to, to do that. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's it, it's really interesting. Like if you compare it uh, to the to the US, like Latin American wages are like a, a third or a or a quarter of, of, of what it is, but it's like it's more more cheap to to live here. Like there are many things that I think we're lagging in in some term, terms of uh, like benefits, like I don't know health insurance, vacation, cell phone, many other other things. But in in general, I think it's because of the AUM. Like Latin America venture capital funds are still early in the AUM. Like the biggest Mexican funds have I don't know one fifty million dollars in AUM. Like that that's kind of the biggest ones in Mexico, Brazil, it's it, it's another thing, but in Mexico and Spanish speaking at time, like this, the biggest funds have this AUM and the AUM is correlated with the management fees and the management fees to the salary and benefits that you can give the team. So in, in the US, it's many cycles uh, after us. So it's, uh, I, I think it's going to take some, some time to, to achieve what has been achieved in the U.S., but we're, we're taking, we're getting there. You've made some comparisons between Spanish-speaking Latam and Brazil. How would you compare them on kind of the highest level of the VC industries, and then also any other insights you want to share that you've kind of picked up based on them uh, with like investment decisions and things like that? Wow, yeah, it's it's a really interesting topic because. Uh, Many VC investors see Latam, sorry, see Brazil as a 
like an outside Latam, another entity, another animal, like, okay, you don't get into Brazil if you don't have a team and, and anything. So uh, what, what I've seen recently, like Brazil, it's, uh, and, and many people have told me, like many Brazilians in, in, from the VC industry, like Brazil, it's ahead of, of, of Mexico City and the rest of Spanish speaking Latam uh, by three to five years, like Sao Paulo, it was, uh, it was really booming uh, three to five years ago, all these startups like there in, in Brazil, you have companies going public in Brazil, like in Mexico, you don't have it. And in the rest of Spanish speaking Latam, you don't have it as well. So that's one thing that that comes to my mind. Also in Brazil, uh, like last year, 50% of all the VC dollars invested in Latam went to Brazil. So it's 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 uh, a really bigger ecosystem and also like the biggest funds monashi skasek canary valor are over there because they were like the pioneers uh, in, in the venture capital industry in in all the region and that's why brazil is ahead ahead from us and also regulate in in the regulatory side like a fintech over there it's uh, it's more easy to open a company in the fintech and in mexico it's really hard like you you need to wait 18 months for an approval by the cnbb and like many regulatory issues that brazil is uh, way ahead of, of of mexico can you tell us a little bit more about the cities as as a as a vc hole because i think that was incredible and especially if we're three to five if mexico and the rest of spanish speaking latin is three to five years behind Brazil. I, I can't wait for those public companies in three to five years, but could you talk more about the the individual cities as well now if, if, as a continuation of your answer about Mexico City versus a Sao Paulo versus uh, a Bogota versus, you know, maybe some of these other smaller but growing VC centers. How, how would you compare that from both the human capital piece? Like where are the smartest VCs going and uh, from an AUM fund distribution side? Yeah, well, Obviously, I'm biased because I'm based in Mexico City, but all the things going on right now in Mexico City, it's it's astonishing. Uh, recently, I talked to Alvaro, Alvaro Rodriguez, managing partner at Igna, of what makes a great ecosystem. Like, what are the things that need to happen in order to create a great ecosystem? And one of, one of the things we discussed is that you need to have capital. You, you mentioned human capital. Also, you need to have these talents, like talents uh, willing to move to the, that city. You need first this human capital, capital uh, as, as in like uh, dollars. Uh, many VC funds are entering, uh, like opening headquarters in, in Mexico City. Many international VC funds uh, from the U.S. are getting to Mexico City and other uh, Brazilian VC funds are opening also headquarters in Mexico City because it's uh, one of the biggest cities in the world. We have 20 million uh, habitants. We also have uh, an, an, another thing that's really vital for this ecosystem. It's that it needs to have the ecosystem needs to be stimulating. So what does that mean? Okay. At the end of the day, we're still people. We need to have fun and have uh, activities. And like Mexico City has tons of art, museum, activities that you can do like in, in your free time. So that's the way that attracts lots of talent from all over the, the, the continent. I, I've met tons of founders moving from uh, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, moving to Mexico City because of how uh, the big, the how big is the market and also because of how the city is really great to like to, to live your life and 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 like as i mentioned before like we're people and at the end of the day we we really want to do some stimulating things and another thing that's vital for the for the ecosystem and, and, and the cities is that you need these services what types of services do i mean it's uh, legal services uh, accounting services financial services like 20 or 10 years ago, like uh, lawyers didn't know how to structure a VC fund. Like, okay, do you uh, structure it as an LP in Canada, as an LP in Delaware? Like, what's the best way to do that? And, and legal taxation for, the, sorry, um, the the taxation involved for your LPs. Like, what's the best way to, to handle that? Okay, so now you have the lawyers, you have the, the accountants that can uh, validate the way that you are doing this uh, accounting for the for the venture capital fund. Like, th this is uh, 
a new thing that's going on in, in, in Latin America and especially in Mexico. So these are four things that, that I've talked to uh, with Alvaro that makes total sense about uh, how to build an, an ecosystem. Speaking about your communications with other VCs and and uh, speaking with these managing partners, you do host a podcast, as you mentioned at the beginning, about Latin American VC, but it's in Spanish and it's called the Levantando Podcast. Why did you start the podcast? And you've mentioned many things that you've learned since speaking with people on it, but may maybe give one or two examples of things that you were like, whoa, that's very interesting that you learned while interviewing people on the podcast. Yeah, I, I started the podcast. It was uh, late June, like uh, I'm, I'm still re really early. And I started it because I, I saw an opportunity. Uh, it was two main reasons. The first, it was that I saw an opportunity in in the space. Like I've... Um, I've seen many podcasts like talking to startups and VCs, but there was none in Spanish talking only to venture capital. So I think there, this was a niche for me like to, to focus on. So this was one thing. And the other thing was, it was uh, an excuse for me so I can talk to the best uh, uh, venture capital fund managers in, in the region. So that's kind of a, an excuse for me. And what I, what I learned from this uh, 14 or 15 episodes so far is that uh, everyone has a unique path. Like none of them come from this uh, investment banking uh, MBA. Well, yeah, many of them have, have an MBA, but I don't know they, they come from different uh, backgrounds regarding, okay, some of them were really involved in, in government. Some of them were involved in innovation startups. Other were like from more for the, from the corporate side. So yeah, really different stories. And, and one trait they all uh, shared that, that I have uh, noticed so far is that launching and raising the first fund is a really, really hard job that you can, you need to be so, so resilient in order to, to raise that fund because it's like, okay, you're new, you don't have a track record, it's hard, you, you don't, uh, you are not going to earn a dime in this uh, one year, two years, what, whatever, it, it, like whatever the time frame is for you to raise a fund, like it's really hard. So yeah, the, all, all of them are stories of resilience. So so yeah, that's that's what I've learned in this uh, levantando podcast so far. What a great answer. Uh, after we, we we both have podcasts about Latin American VC, but we were also both microeconomics teaching assistants in college. So I have a question for you. What is your favorite microeconomic concept that also plays a role in VC or technology? Well, we're really interesting question. And um, I think it's the, the simplest one, um, supply and demand. Like I've seen when I joined the industry in 2020 and I've been through 2021 and right now 2022, the market's totally different. And in 2021, like, these uh, mega rounds and this series A, these hot rounds, like the, these uh, am amazing founders and, and everything, like there were tons of demands from VCs to get into these deals. And what happened? Okay, when you get tons of demand to be in the round, the price went up and a lot. And right now in 2022, that demand is not so high. What ha what's happening? Valuations are going down. So it's a really interesting concept. Like it's uh, really simple. Like I, I think everyone knows uh, what supply and demand is, and you don't need to have a an economics major. And how that translates into the venture capital world, it's really interesting in in the terms in the in the valuation of the of the startups. Could you talk about your day to day at your current role and your previous role at Duke's Capital? Yeah, well, my, my day to day, it's really different. Like it varies from one day to another. Like I think 50% uh, of, of a venture capitalist is you need to be out, out there sourcing deals. And how do you do that? Okay, you need to build a strong network of, of, of founders, of other venture capital folks, and other, um, also you need to be... Uh, really connected in the industry, also attending demo days, uh, being connected to accelerators. And also thanks to these rising Latin VCs, I have created uh, and, and gained uh, great friends that we share deals and, and, and they 
I don't know if, if I have a friend that's only focused on a fintech, I say, hey, this is a fintech startup. It can fit the, your, your funds thesis. And he uh, returns the favor and, and sends me a prop tech deal. So yeah, it's, it's a really collaborative thing in this uh, venture capital world. And also, uh, aside from sourcing, like the diligence, okay, once you think a company might be great, it might be a fit for, your, for the investment thesis of the fund, this company, you need to do a due diligence. And what does that mean? It's okay, you get into financials, legal, business, economics, and like the most important thing everyone tells you, it's really getting to know the founder. Like you're, you're investing in a company because of the team. Like that's kind of one of the main drivers of an, of, uh, an investment decision. So, so yeah, like the due diligence, sourcing, uh, portfolio reporting, portfolio support obviously you have to add value to the companies you're already invested in it's like okay hey i need help with this i, I need an intro with other vc fund hey i'm raising debt okay i'm making you an intro with a venture debt hey i need a, a commercial intro with other startup in with other startups in order to sell like there are many things that you can do in in a day to uh in the day to day for a vc so that's why i love the job like it's not uh monotone it's uh it's changing like from day to day and and that's what what uh, really makes me like it so much how do you go about crafting the questions for your podcast and the reason why it's in your style is because you shared with me that you do not share the questions uh with your podcast guests before like i do so i'd be interested to know how do you how do you craft those questions yeah well how how i decide what questions i'm gonna ask like it depends on on what uh, the the guest has has done has achieved and like uh, before any 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 interview with with a, a fund manager like i think the most important thing is to do a great uh, research like that's where you stand out from from other uh, podcasters or of or, or for being a, a great interview or not like you need to make a great research and what has your your guests mentioned in other podcasts and, and everything so I think that's the way I select the questions I'm going to do. Like, okay, if, if, if a fund manager has to mention anything about the time he spends with his portfolio companies, okay, I'm going to ask that. Or I don't know if an idea he mentioned in another podcast and that idea was uh, just said briefly, okay, I'm going to uh, click on it and double down and like try to understand this idea uh, more. So it depends from guest to guest, but I think all the all the magic happens when you do the a great research about about the guest. Brand, finally, I have to ask Peter Thiel's famous contrarian question with uniquely Samia VC twist. What important truth about Latin America or Mexico do very few people agree with you on? Great question. Um, I think what happens in Latam that many won't agree or is that the education you receive uh, really matters at the time of making an investment decision. And what do I mean with this? Like, okay, imagine yourself, you're a startup or a venture capital fund raising capital, okay? You're, this can apply to, a, to an LP or, or, or a VC fund investing in a startup. So unfortunately, where, you, where did you go to school matters and matters a lot for, for, the, for Latin America at the moment. Like, I, I think... Um, we can change it. We can change it in, in the next few years, but it matters a lot. Like, see all the unicorns in Latam. Like, the majority of them, of the founders, went uh, went to uh, graduate school and have an MBA. So that thing is okay. You have these elite founders, not non-elite founders, underrepresented. Like, they need to have more access for all this uh, knowledge. And what you're doing at, at Semillas, it's really helpful for the ecosystem and for all these uh, underrepresented founders and underrepresented VCs that, okay, may, maybe they don't have an MBA or, or they do not uh, went to the top universities in, in their countries. I don't know, in Argentina, Mexico, Chile, like you, you name it. But if, if they don't went to the top, it's hard to get this network of, of I don't know, potential investors, potential uh, founders, and I think education and, and your background really matters right now in, in LATAM, unfortunately. 
but I think this uh, inequality can be reduced if, if you uh, like if if more content is produced around it and you can uh, you can uh, have more access to these types of, of of content or information like okay you don't need venture capital to be uh, a topic of just the top 10 percent of the population no like okay if, if if a guy from coming from the really uh, low class and he may don't have a college degree and he wants to make a startup and it can be a great startup like okay he needs to have access to all these contact contents and also access to the venture capital uh, uh, funds so yeah i think it's gonna take a while to get there but yeah i think right now in, in a time unfortunately uh, your education and where did you go to school uh, matters and matters a lot that's very interesting fran thank you so much for taking the time to come on my podcast today no thank you so much for 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 the time trip and great questions and yeah i'm happy happy to to share with with your audience thank you thank you for watching this episode of cine vc my name is trip gorman don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you view the podcast and don't forget to check out our newsletter dealflow la which can be found by going to dealflow.la